Go, pal. How are you? Hi, Eric. How are you? Yeah, not bad, buddy. Thank you so much for, for agreeing to, to do a little interview with me. It's, it's absolutely amazing to be uh, getting to chat with you. That's all right. No, no worries. Here for a good time. So I'll, I'll, I'll start us off. I always uh, seem to come to this question uh, with anyone I chat to. Um, so Henley Royal, Hen, Henley Royal Regatta is like the peak of my season. I'm a club athlete in the UK and it's always our aim to qualify and hopefully go through a few rounds of Henley. Um, do, you, do you have good memories of Henley? I, the, there's probably only one regret about Henley and, and that's that we didn't go there enough. Um, you know, when, when we started rowing, you, you hear about Henley and, and obviously in the last sort of decade, it's been, been well publicised, YouTube, um, you know, obviously social media. Uh, but prior to that, you'd, you'd hear the occasional person sort of talk about it from, from sort of back in the day on, in terms of like New Zealand rowing, um, mainly because I think first and foremost, you hear about it because in 1980, when they boycotted uh, Moscow, like our eight and our crews all went to Henley. So it was sort of like, oh, okay, oh, okay there's, this, there's this big regatta overseas. But then once you start to understand more about rowing and, you know, and obviously social media played a massive part in that, then you'd see all these people going to this regatta and you'd be like, shit, that looks cool. Like knockout, never done that. Cause we don't have anything like that down here in New Zealand. Um, could probably start it up. Um, but it was, it, it sort of, once we got into it and Mahe went like early in the piece and he was loving it and he'd always talked about it. And I was just like, why aren't we going? And so, wasn't until like 2009 that we sort of got our first opportunity to go to Henley. Um, and yeah, I loved it probably a little bit too much. Um, but you know, the, <laughs> the thing is, well, that's the thing, right? Because it's, it's not just the rowing, it's the atmosphere and it's the, the drinking and, and everything else and the partying that goes on. And of course, you know, I'm sitting there we've we've won the semi-final and all my mates that we used to row in the four with, um, you know, the guys from the Netherlands and some of the GB boys and, and of course, they're just there, like having a great time. Um, and I'm there on the beers, and they're like, "You want another one?" I'm like, "Sure thing." And then, of course, now it's six, seven o'clock at night, and you're like, "Shit, I better go home because I got a final tomorrow." Um, and and that's and that's the problem is because you get caught up in all the atmosphere and the hype. But that's what it's about, and that's what fascinates me about Henley, and I love it for that reason. Um, you know, because it is such a different, it's such a different way of 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 creating rowing and and delivering it to people um, rather than just your straight out 2k whatever it is on a course it's this knockout event you know and it and it's so much different than what else you get in rowing and that's what makes it special um, so every time that we've been you know we, we went three times yeah three times in our career um, and as I say going back to it I just really wish we could have gone more um, you know maybe even tried to race in another event um, just, just for the fun of it, um, and and it would have been, you know, it could have been pretty cool. Yeah, it's uh, something properly special uh, about that event. Uh, I think it, it's so many people's dream to go and win it, win it, or go and do well in it. Of course, you turn up, win it. I think three times. Yeah, yeah, we yeah we won it three times, and um, you know, every time the, the thing with it is completely different. And what made it special is the fact that. Um, <laughs> like we probably never ever led to the barrier in any of our races with anybody that we ever raced against. So shit, you know, we could probably look back on the records. I got the book, I got the book sitting on the shelf with all the you know the little handbooks that you get every day. Um, and but no, like no one cares. Like it's like I'll go for it, you know. And there were these young guys. Shit, they probably had two lengths clear water on us by the barrier, and and then it was like they literally just stopped rowing because they were toast. But it didn't matter, you know. They're like, "Oh well, we led Murray and Bond to the barrier. It's on paper. Who cares?" And of course, that'll be a, be a great <laughs> highlight. Um, and I and I would have done exactly the same if I was in their position. And that's what makes it fascinating about the event is that people just go to to set records at the barrier or Foley or wherever you're going. Um, and 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 that's that's it, you know, because um, because it is such a different event. Um, you can do those types of things, and whether you're there to participate because it's your first time there or you just want to be there um, for it um, you know only out of out of the end of it there's only two people get to the final and there's only one crew that wins it you know so the odds are stacked against you quite a lot and you've got to be on you've got to have luck of the draw 
Um, you've got to have good conditions or even luck of the draw on which lane you get, um, depending on the conditions. So there's so many other factors that go into it, which just make that complexity and fascination of it. Yeah, so really, uh, really brilliant event. Um, so to, to move on to, to, to the rest of your, your career, or maybe actually your, your race tactics, um, you, you mentioned that some people would go out and race you to the barrier, um, but you were you and Hamish were quite well known for not necessarily leading off the start. Uh, so yeah, there's some there's some good stats on that. Probably even if I've I've interrupted your question. Um, no, 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 go <laughs> but on. Uh, if we look back, I I data mined all our races. Okay, um, I probably pull it up on my computer because obviously in COVID, nothing to do. So I data mined all our races and I got the statistics on our average race time, um, average time to second place, to third place, um, the, like where we were in conjunction to all the other crews at different parts of, of, um, uh, of the race. So in our first four year cycle from, from 09 to 012, there was probably only about half a dozen, 10 times out of 30 odd races. Um, that we weren't in front after 500 meters. Um, then flip that on its head and in the <laughs> preceding four years up to Rio, um, twice, I think we were in front at 500 meters. Oh, wow. So I don't know, I feel like there was, there were, there's two reasons for that. One was a philosophical change from us um, where we were like, why are we burning so much gas in the first 500 when we know we've got a superior speed that we can handle through the middle part of the course. but um, and and at the other time, on the other side, sorry, um, everybody else got quicker. So everybody else was like, if we want to get in front of the Kiwis, we have to do it by getting in front and then seeing how we can go with our rhythm and our form and and, and et cetera. And there were quite a few occasions where we were we were either we were up there or we we were still trying to close in on people with five hundred meters to go. Um, I think we probably had three or four races where we weren't in front with 500 metres to go. Um, you know, they were, majority of the time, they were heats or semi-finals. And, and, and I, I just put myself into everybody else's shoes where it's like, we were, we were the standard, we were the gold standard. And didn't matter if it was a heat or a semi-final, why would you not try and beat us? You know, because that, that's your opportunity because everybody's thinking, okay, it's a heat. We only need to do just enough to get through to the semi-final. And it's like, fuck that. Why don't we just absolutely blow our cookies and try and beat Kiwis? Um, and the, the Serbians, um, Vesic and Bednik, they used to do it all the time. Every time we turned up and they were in our race in the heat or the semi, I'd always say to Hamish, I'd be like, bloody Serbians, because they, they used to take it to us every time. Okay, and, and majority, there was, there's a couple of times they, they were leading us shit well through the 500 to go one time in Lucerne. And I was like, holy shit, we're going to have to really go. And we did. We got through them. And then they were spent. The rest of their regatta was terrible. Okay, but they didn't care because that was obviously the way they were doing it. So the, the thing with our race tactics and in, in terms of stuff was that um, you, you've got to have the confidence to know like your fade okay and and i don't think a lot of people appreciate the way that you need to sort of be be trying to go at it and it came back from a coach of ours when we were in the four chris nelson and he used to say to us especially we were in the four he'd be like if you fade more than one second between the second and third 500 you should be disappointed and so that was always the goal because everybody goes here 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 and then they sprint towards the finish so everybody is slowing down right we, we can all agree we all agree Everybody is slowing down from the first to the second to the third 500, right? So you, well, you slowing down. Yeah. So what if you don't slow down? What does that achieve? That achieves one second of sort of passive speed from other people. You're not going any far, like you're, you're, you're going faster than them, but all you're actually doing is sl not slowing down as much as these other crews. So uh, like I looked at our, I've got a graph of it. I'll send, I'll send you some data later. And um. Um, in all our big races, we had zero fade. Like it is, we actually went 0 0.01 second quicker in the third 500 than we went in the second 500. And there's no other crew in the world that could do that. Okay, and we were, and we were only we were only fading one second between the first and the second 500. And so this is where this is where your 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 conversation going from the question is that 
instead of you going out and we'll use round numbers here and go a 135 and then a 138 or a 139, why don't you do a 136? So you're going to be a second and a half or maybe two seconds behind at the first 500. But now you're going to be either level or maybe even in front by the thousand just because you haven't slowed down as much. And then while everybody slows down another two seconds and you don't slow down anymore, now you're two seconds in front. So that was really the whole philosophy of what we did in training was just no fade, no slowing, keep the speed and keep the rhythm. Wasn't about explosive power, um, wasn't about being able to do like a 120 or whatever, 500. Um, that wasn't part of our protocol. Our protocol was to be like, let's just not slow the boat down. Um, and, and that was really the philosophy that we took in those, in those second four years. Um, and there's so many, like you even look at, Look at the Olympic final in Rio, you know, like people just boom and they're gone. And we're like coming through in fifth place or maybe even last, whatever the hell it was. Um, but then once everybody just started slowing down because they've done a 133 and now they're going to do a 140 and here's us doing a 135 and maybe a 137, we're going to be in front of you, you know, and that's basically the way that it worked out. So did, were you not nervous though? There, there must have been a time oh, where yeah. you we fully switched approach and it it went that you were you weren't in the lead after 500 so was that not terrifying do you not get through the 500 and think oh what have we done uh yeah yeah I, yes yes and we had to deal with it okay so um we we started but we we did a lot of like i, I think it's probably underestimated the amount of practice that we did on on our racing and our speed and all this sort of stuff where you know on Carapiro the New Zealand program is about testing yourself twice a week against your opposition like your team on a prognostic basis so Wednesday and Saturday was always a prognostically tested piece whether it was 8k 5k 4k two 4ks some 2k sub max but whatever it was thousands 500 you name it even went out to 15k one time it was horrific um but of course, it was just like, this is this is your test. This is the way that you've got to be able to do it. Because if you're on the top prognostically, it means that you're going to be better than, than everybody else when you get overseas and, and race internationally. So that was really the situation is we got to test ourselves all the time. So we were just trying to find out that rhythm and that speed. So we'd go off in 5Ks, right? And we'd, we'd get a, say, I think it was about, normally it was about a 10 or 15 second lead on the men's double. By the 1,000 meter mark, they're next to us. Right, they've got 4K to go. Guess who's in front at the finish? You know what I mean? So it was just like we would practice that to get to get under that pressure and then find that rhythm and find that efficiency. And that was really all we were trying to do. Like all the calls in the boat were just no fade, smooth, no slow, just everything about what we were trying to do was just to keep that boat running because you've only got so much energy and everybody thinks, oh, you've got to do these big pushes and all these big things. And, and to get that speed and gain that speed, it's like, don't waste your energy trying to add speed because you, you're the amount of the amount of energy that you add to try and gain more speed is way more detrimental than actually probably relaxing a little bit, just letting the boat run a bit more, trying to find that rhythm and the flow. And so then your boat actually just won't slow down because you gain the speed and what happens? And how much yeah. energy did you use? A fuck ton, right? And so all of this push and push and push rather than just being right, just focus, smooth, rhythm. And so you're still working hard. We're all working hard, okay? There's no, there's no doubt about that. But it's about how can you just be more efficient than another crew? Can you have your catches sharper? Are we starting to just miss the front a bit? Are we starting to try and pull it a bit hard at the finish rather than letting it run out, you know, but a bit more patience? Um, and so that was really the way that we, we talked about it to be able to, to get that rhythm, to get that, um, that, that sort of, I guess, speed through the middle part of the race. But yeah, it was a lot of times you'd come through and you'd just be like, you know, and, and I remember Martin Cross, um, you know, I'd watch some of my videos every now and again and he'd be like, I don't know why Eric's looking out because he knows they're going to be passing the cruise in the 100. But I'm like, yeah, I've still, got to, I've still got to take note of where everyone is because someone gone out way far, I'm like, oh, shit, okay, we might have to just put in a little bit more effort just to make sure that it doesn't become uncomfortable when we're in the third 500 and we're still laying in front of somebody because that's obviously when it starts. You're, you're under the pump. You know they're under the pump. And you're like, well, if we can't make any inroads, this is going to be very difficult in this last part. We're going to have to really dip into that that like desperation bag. Um, and we, we had to do that on a couple of occasions, but it was just, it was, it was the way that we approached it was like, 
race to the 1500 and then worry about anything after that. We still had that up our sleeve, but it was really just about making sure that that first 1500 of the race was as good as it can be rather than being like, right, we'll get through the third and we'll wait till the last 500 and then we'll start winding it for home. It's like get the race out of the way with before that point and then you don't have to worry about it. And so that was really the philosophy. That's amazing philosophy. It seems it seems stupid almost that nobody else seems to have that philosophy. It's- well, but it's but it's such a like you've been in races, right? It's so hard to be in that position where you're a length even clear water behind after five hundred meters. Yeah. Like what are you what are you thinking? You're like, oh, that race is over. You know, should how are we going to get back through these guys? But of course, that's and and this is where you've got to be doing it in training, and you've got to be able to know what your fade limit is, and and you've got to be doing the testing pieces, and you've got to be doing so much stuff at at, at high rate to try or sub maximum, trying to get the rhythm and the flow, so that then yeah, you're like, okay, we've got another, you know, say for example, they're in front, you're like, well, we've got another four and a half minutes or five minutes until we have to worry about where we are. So let's just take it minute by minute by minute. Okay, the next minute, we've got to keep the rhythm. The next minute's going to be harder. The fourth minute's going to be the hardest because you're through the third 500. And then you'll be like, okay, but can we, we've got three minutes. We've got four minutes to get back through them. There's a lot that can change in four minutes, you know? And and I think that's the thing is we, we think about the current moment where you're like, shit, we're behind. Rather than thinking, okay, what are we going to do from here to keep this rhythm going? What can we do better than we're doing currently? Um, because you know, and I've been in races, I've done it myself, I know how it works, fly and die tactic, we've all been there, we've all done it. And I think that's one of the things, once you learn about that and you know and you can you can sense the energy that's been expended by people just by their their voice or their breathing or just the sound or the coxswain, you know, when he's like, rah, 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 you know, like when he's really going for it, you know that they're putting in probably a bit too much energy than they should be. And so this is where, but it's it's a confidence thing because this is why, um, you know, we had tens, 20, 50 races in fours and stuff, even before we got on the pier to start to understand what it's like. We had races yeah. here in Carapero as clubs to understand. I had races in the singles to understand. So it's just a learning experience, which takes you to that point where once you get that maturity, you you do understand sort of what you're able and capable of achieving. And that's probably the end of it is that like what you, you've got to understand your realistic expectations and know what you're capable of achieving. And we knew what we were capable of achieving. So that's just the way that we wanted to approach it. So did you carry that philosophy over onto the Erg of the go out, settle and stay on it? Or were you, um, did you, does it, does it change when you're looking at a screen? Uh, no. So, so are you, you're talking like 2K stuff and, and like oh, piecework and bits and 5K, pieces. 5K, yep. you've got records yep. for pretty much everything. <laughs> yeah, we'll see the erg, the erg's the easiest, right? And and I and I and I talk to people about it, and I and I coach some people about it. Um, the one thing that people don't quite understand, like it's the same thing, right? As it's as you've got, you've only got so much energy. It's like a pie, right? Imagine your total energy being a pie. If you chop off a third of that and eat it in the first quarter of the time, you've only got three quarters of the pie left to go. So now you've got to now you've got to cut that up into three pieces, and those three pieces are quite small. And that's why you'll see people do go out at a one thirty, then they'll do a one thirty five, then they'll do a one forty, and then they're like, then they're in the pit of despair in the last five hundred, trying to wind it, and they ain't got nothing left, and they'll blow up, and they'll be like, oh shit, I was trying to do a six ten, I did six fifteen, whatever, okay, round number. But if you actually just go out there and go, okay, I think I can hold a, a one, I can hold a one thirty two all the way. Okay. And you go out at 132 with your rate. What you're actually trying to do is just increase your rating. So leave the speed where it is and increase your rating. So if you rate 34 for the first 500, 35 for the second, 36 for the third, and then 37 plus for the last, right? And what you're actually doing, what you're actually doing is you're actually using less power per stroke, but you're actually just doing more strokes. Now it's only one stroke. It's only one stroke a minute or whatever, but if you, if you calculate it and you look at it in terms of science and physiology, instead of you doing 380 watts per stroke, you only have to do 360, okay? It's 20 watts less per stroke. But yes, you've got to do two more strokes per 500 or whatever it is, right? Not a big deal. And I think that's what people don't quite get the grasp of. 
is that you, you, you can use your rate and your speed because we all sit on the machine and we rate 20. And then what do we do when we go up to 24? All we're doing is putting in more strokes. Are you putting in twice as much effort or are you putting in, say, 5% more effort or 10% more effort? Okay, you don't actually have to do a lot. Okay, but yes, you start getting up into the exponential growth right at the top. And I, and I do understand that. But it's easier to just even split and use your bit more freedom and a bit more rate to be able to get that speed rather than thinking, I'm just going to blast it out and then I'm going to slow down and then I'm probably going to slow down again and then I'm going to wind it to the finish. You're better off to try and find where that even split is. But it's hard because you've got the adrenaline pumping for the first 500. You're like, oh, I'm going to go rather than just getting into it, getting into a rhythm, and then just staying there and focusing. And I could show you splits of my 2K, and that's exactly that. Like I rated high. I was like 37, 38, 39, 40. But that's just because that was how I, I attacked the ERG, was quite high rating. Less power, more rate. And that started transferring a little bit across into like the pair where we would rate high. Why did we rate high? Because we just didn't want to we didn't want to have to use the power. We wanted to use the rhythm and the speed of the boat and picking up the catch and not letting it slow down. Um, and we weren't like Hamish wasn't as big as a lot of the other guys. So what do you got to do? He's not going to outpower them. 100% he ain't going to outpower them. Um, so we had to use a different method, which was just a little bit more freedom and rate. Um, and that's basically how I approached the UG. And, um, and that's why I could even split things like, every day of the week. And, and it worked very, very, very well. You, I, I think you must have watched there. My mind just uh, getting blown by the idea of like instead of more power, more rates as you go through. Because yeah, this, this, this is this is this is the, the nah, misconception. It's a complete misconception, right? Next time you do, next time you're just doing some pieces or something like that. Um, you know, you could do you could do like an eight minute piece and just start like sub sub max type of thing. Go 28, 30, 32, 34. Okay. Don't think about more power. Just think about more speed and freedom. And I guarantee you, you'll see the speed. Well, the speed will slightly come down because of, like, obviously at that rate. Um, but you're all you're doing is just moving a little bit quicker. You're not thinking about adding that more power. Um, and you you will see a difference. You will see a massive difference. Okay, you've got to train for it. This is the one thing. This is probably, I guess, the. Um, <laughs> We, we've got to disclose is that yeah you have to be able to train for it you have to be able to get to that rate um but you see it, you quite often see and and it is one of the things that you see a lot of people just sitting on sort of 30 to 32 rate for a 2k you've got to keep it free you've got to speed it up it's only you versus the machine you've got to keep the hands moving you just you know and it and it's learning about how the machine works and how the biomechanics of the machine work you don't need to hit the hands into the body. You're wasting energy, right? It's, it's legs and body. Swing through the stroke, get the hands away, and just fucking roll forward with the machine. And then once you start doing that, don't hit the front, and you know that it's an acceleration through the drive, so you're not trying to hit the front. Um, and just learning and getting that, and all you're trying to do is get the flywheel spinning, and again, and again, and again. You're not trying to make it go every time. You're just trying to – You it's basically like being on the water. You're just trying not to let the flywheel slow down. Um, and I think that's what people start and sort of slightly miss. But at the same time, yes, it is still hard. Yes, you're still putting in a lot of energy, but it's trying to balance out where your red line is and sitting on the red line or just here, right? Because the moment you're up here, you're out, right? That's that's last 250. Once, once you start going or when, whenever, you, whenever you decide to start winding it, once you cross that red line, ain't no coming back. Lactic acid's gone up through the roof. You're in an anaerobic uh, zone, no more aerobic. Oxygen means fuck all from that point. Um, and, and that's it. And so that's really this, that's really what you've got to try and teach yourself to do. Is find where your red line is. Or find where your benchmark is and just keep trying to fucking punch it a little bit higher, a little bit higher. Um, and that's how you get better. That's the only way you can get better. Um, so just to, to follow on from that, that's some brilliant advice. <laughs> I'm loving this. I'm, I'm almost going to become quite selfish here and just uh, try and extract all of your wisdom uh, from the erg and <laughs> on the water. <laughs> so during lockdown, I was on your Ascensei and your own YouTube channel following along your ergs. It gave me someone to listen to and row along with. And quite often you talk about being powerful for, for, for the steady state ones. You're like working hard in them. 
And there almost seems to be two philosophies where it comes to the steady state, where some people treat it really easy, keep their heart rate really low. I get the sense that you've been, for your long rugs, you like to push them. Well, it's the the it's it's all down to physiology, right? And and it's just what we learned while I was in my time like rowing, is that physiology, the way to get fitter is to be training at, at majority of the time at 80% of your max heart rate. Okay. And so like what's 80% of your max heart rate? It's pretty hard work, right? And and at the time my heart rate was sort of 200 max, somewhere around there. So if I got on the ERG and I'm pushing it along and I'm looking at 145s on my heart rate, I'm like, I'm not working hard enough. I've got to push it a little bit more. Now I'm looking at 160s. I'm like, yeah, this is where I've got to be and this is what I've got to work at. So it is a, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword because people don't, like people obviously don't know that level. Um, they haven't had the experience in training. But if you can, the, the whole reason of this 80% number, right, is that if you can train at 80%, it means that you've only got 20% to gain to get to your max, okay? So you've only got that far to, to bridge. If you're training down here at like 60% of your max or 70% of your max, you've got 30% to bridge to get to your top level. And so it's just, it takes more, um, you just don't have the same sort of feelings and the same uh, physiology in your muscles and the same stress levels that you can handle if you've only been doing things down at that low level, because what it does is it stops you from reaching that ceiling because it's such a big gap that you get to that 20, 25% gap in terms of your body and your body starts saying, no, 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 look, I've, I've, I've tapped out, but you've still got that potential for another five, 10%. And I think that's what people don't quite understand is that the harder you train down here, the easier it is to start pushing on your top level up the top um, and and it's it's all part of science. You look at any program in the world, and you look at any any lactate testing and any rowing program. I guarantee you, people are looking at that eighty percent mark. They've got all of their zones on how much you should be training in this zone, this zone, and this zone this week. And that and that's really what it comes down to in terms of even being on the erg, which which is what I do with some of the programming stuff, is that you've got to split up the days. You know, you have to have. Uh, your UT2, you know, some UT1 stuff, some anaerobic threshold. Um, and you've got to mix and mingle those all part of one because you can't just go on there every day and just do like pieces or whatever. You have to have some low intensity. You have to have some high intensity. You've got to mix it up week by week and cycles go in. So there's, there is quite a lot of complexity. Um, but to be fair, the, the better you can do it at that low rate, um, the easier it is and the faster that you can actually go once you get up to speed. Uh, that's um, really interesting. Um, but to, just to, to come back at you there, because I, I, can, I can feel the, the complaints about sitting at 80% of your heart rate. How, how, would, how would you recover from that, especially when you're training? It's not that hard, but it's not that hard. 80% of your maximum heart rate. You should be able to have clarity, be breathing. All it is is your heart rate, just like boom, 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 right? That's all it is. It's not... It's not like you're, yeah. you know, like when, when, you're, when you're doing it, if you're, if you're having to like uh, to get to your 80% of your heart, your maximum heart rate, um, you're doing something wrong in terms of your technique. It's not, yeah. it's not anything to do with the heart rate because like, you know, it's no different, you know, like you go out for a jog or you're on the bike, right? And, and you just hold the intensity and you're like, this is, this is pretty good. You know, like we're rowing and it's, it's, it's pretty like, whew, I'm, I'm feeling I'm feeling the effects of my effort that I'm putting in. That should be what you're looking for if you're wanting that improvement. If you don't want the if you don't want the improvement, if you're on here just for fitness and health and well-being, don't worry about what your heart rate's doing. It doesn't matter. If you're looking for improvement, then absolutely you need to start getting a little bit better with the intensity level that you're training with. And the 80% number is a gold standard in terms of physiology. Um, and we used it religiously and i know it's still being used religiously now in the program here well brilliant that, so well thank you for, for sharing your wisdom there um can do, do you think anyone can anyone get super fast on an erg is do you, yeah. do you have to be yeah. something special to go sub six or 
Uh, you do, you do like, you've got to have, you've got to have the three elements, right? You've, you've, you, you do have to have a little bit of size on your side. Um, you have to have, uh, obviously the fitness, um, and you've got to have the technique and probably the attitude. I, I'd say attitude's probably one that's stacked on the top of that. Um, which, and, and what I mean by attitude is, is the willingness to like, to, to kill yourself, to get there basically, yeah. um, but if, but if you have if you have the right technique and the right understanding of how to use the rowing machine, right? And and there's <laughs> there's there's so many ways that people like think that the rowing machine should be done, and, and everybody's completely different because of your size and everything else. But I just look at people like Hamish, and I and I look at people like Nathan Cohen, who you know obviously won the double in London and stuff. You know these guys are in their eighty kilograms, and they're going like Hamish was in the 540s and Nathan was low 550s. So you're like going, well, that's not stopping them. But then on the other side, they had they had the the attitude, obviously, because they just little nuggets that really wanted to rip it out. They they knew how to to do the technique um, and, the, and they had the physiology. You know, they had the training behind them, the amount of hours on the different aspects, on the 80%, on the interval training, on the sub-maximum, on the AT and, and the um, anaerobic threshold stuff. So they, they had that ability to do it. And I think the majority of what happens on the rowing machine is, is dictated by technique, right? It, it is dictated by technique. And it goes right back to that question about the pie um, and how much is there. Because the moment you start using too much energy because you lose the form or you're not doing the form in the best way, because we, we're against the machine, right? We don't have to worry about outside. We don't have to worry about balance. We don't have to worry about other shit that's going on. You know, all oh, shit, bad stroke. Now we've got to get the speed back up, all this sort of stuff. All you're trying to do is get your body into a rhythm, back and forward, back and forward. Use the body, use use the legs to drive the body, um, and just get into this big swinging motion, back and forward, back and forward. Um, and then you just basically every stroke, you're just going right. I've got X amount of pie, and every stroke, I'm just going to eat another bite, another bite, another bite, all the way through, and then you'll get to your time. And and that's really the that's really the only way you can do it. But I feel like majority of it comes down to technique. Because what happens with technique on the row machine is if you can if you can get the understanding that you you've got to have the legs driving the body open basically all at one go. Um, uh, you, you look at some of the, like some of the British guys do it very well. Um, we did it very well. Hamish did it very well. I see I see a lot of um, athletes that can do it right uh, quite well. I think Valent Sinkovic does it very well. Um, where you've got to open everything out at one go. Boom, way go go for it. Don't push the legs and swing the body. The legs driving the body is what creates the acceleration, um, and and the way and one of the, the best examples of um, of like technique that I that I I because so you try and explain it to people that you've got to accelerate through the stroke, right? You can't take it all from the front because it just it's too heavy. Like the flywheel's got to get up to speed again, so it's like a spinning top, you know, like all those Beyblades for the younger people. You know, yeah. you can't make it go straight off the thing. What happens is it accelerates through. And the flywheel is no different as you've got to get the acceleration through the stroke. And when is it at its most accelerated? You look at the force curve, you look at all the data that's on the rowing machine, and it's when the legs and the body are driving together. So if you can get that and time that right through the middle for a big chunk of that, of that force curve, um, you are creating speed and you're creating the flywheel revolutions. Because at the end of the day, all, all at the speed on the screen is is the number of revolutions that you're making that 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 flywheel move. That's all that it is, right? And so the the better you can get those revolutions by using that legs and the body, uh, the better you go. Not using the arms, not getting tense in the shoulders, hanging underneath it. You you relate it back to lifting weights off the floor, right? Like doing a clean. Yeah. What your arms? You look at these guys deadlifting five hundred kilograms and shit, right? Thousand pounds or whatever the fuck they're doing, um, or five hundred pounds, whatever. And and you like, but but the thing is, what are they holding on to it with? Their hands and their arms, right? We're, we're, we're evolved from this and these appendages, right? That can hold a shit ton of weight. Um, and so all we're doing is, all they're doing is hanging out in front of us as we swing the body back through rather than being like this and trying to grab because any once, uh, and we all know it, right? We've all been in a race where we get forearm pump or whatever, you know, like being in a single or being in a, in a, in a, in a sculling boat and you're like, shit, I can't hold my hands anymore. Do you know what's gone? The small muscles. Right, not the big muscles. It's the small muscles. So yeah. the moment you bring those small muscles into play, 
is the moment that you start to really wane and to get uh, and like start slowing down and you just get like you get fatigued in the small little muscles and you're like, oh, no, nah, I'm fucked because I've got to hold this or I've got to pull it in. Then you get all tense up in here and, and next minute you see people doing this on the machine. And it's like, but if you had just let the big muscles until they wear out and just hang off the pieces that you don't need to, um, you can find some really, really easy speed. And I've changed, I've created some really good speed in people just by getting the understanding that it's big muscle groups swing through the stroke. Um, and we see that now with a lot of, and, and it's sort of a lot of that's changed from what sort of Hamish and I were doing. And even people like Drew Jin, and you see like the Australian programs, and there's a lot more patience on the recoveries. And then there's a lot more body swinging through the strokes rather than being a lot more like, you know, leg swing type of movement. Um, there is a lot more sort of flow and swing to, to a lot of people's strokes. And I think it was just missing. I think it just was, it's been a, it's been a change in terms of people's philosophy of their coaching for their athletes. Um, and, and I think there's some people that do it very, very well. It's Tom George, right? It's he guy in the pair. Yeah. But yeah. Um, he does it brilliantly. Like you look at the style compared to like, I guess the traditional very blocky style of like a great British rowing crew where they're sort of sitting there very upright, very tense, where he's got a little bit of flex in his back and all he does is he just swings back through the stroke, right? And it looks beautiful. Um, you watch him on the rowing machine. The reason that he's been able to absolutely pump out those rowing sessions is because he swings back through. He's not trying to rip it into the finish. You know, the occasional video you see on it, it's very relaxed. And all he's doing is using his size to go boom and swing back through the stroke. So that's, and that's where you go back to like, yeah, you've got to have a bit of size, but I still think people above 85 kilograms have the potential to break six minutes. You know, it's very, uh, once you start getting under that, there's probably a lot more in terms of strength and fitness that have to go to actually make you go fast. That's, that's uh, good news for me because I'm <laughs> I'm about 85 kilos, so uh, I'll see what I can do there. Um, so I just noticed we've got one minute left. Uh, do you mind if I do you want send you another uh, another link yep. after? Yep. Yeah, um, yeah, let's do it. 